but that you'd be honored in everything we do in our worship of you and the sharing and encouragement. Just uh, help us to experience your presence this morning and to be changed so that you would be more honored in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let us love and sing and wonder. Psalm 100 says this, Psalm 100, shout, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful singing, know that the Lord himself is God, it is he who has made us and not we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture, 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. So this speaks to what God has done for us, but also his character and why we should praise him. So he has made us first and not we ourselves. So there's nothing that we have done for ourselves, in other words, including just making us like very basic. God, from the beginning to the end, has made us all we are today. The choice then is always going to thank him. And then he says, we are the people, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So it's not just that he made us, he's also sustaining us and taking care of us. And then, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, and bless his name. So he's worthy of our praise. He is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. So he, by his very nature, is good. He is the only one that is good. So he is worthy of our praise. And we have to see that all that he does is good. And only those who receive this can be seen as good. Those who receive his love, those who acknowledge and admire and are thankful for his faithfulness. So let's praise him this morning. All right, we're going to go to page five. Page five, we're going to sing Unchanging. Page five, Unchanging.
page six. Page six. We'll sing uh, You Are God Alone. It's on page six. God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. Page 18, we'll sing, There is a Redeemer. Who 
page 18, there is our Redeemer. Do one more on page 23. Page 23, we'll sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues. Oh, 
morning who are using our mouths to sing your praise. Lord, we know that our biggest problem uh, is not our health, it's not our finances, it's not our even our family, Lord, it's our relationship with you. That was our biggest problem. We could not have a relationship with you because we were sinners and we were dead. And Lord, you tell us in your word that you sacrificed your only son who never did anything wrong to pay our debt. And now we can have a relationship with you that we could never have before. And so now, Lord, all our problems are solved because that was the only problem, was our relationship with you. We know now that whatever we face, whether it's death or trial or hardship, that at the end of it, we're going to be with you forever. And so we praise you for that this morning. We thank you that you have seen a sister of ours carried safely home. You were faithful to her and you got her through the trial that was the end of her life. Lord, we thank you that she's more alive now than any of us are. We thank you that you're taking care of us the same way you took care of her. We can have hope that we will meet again. So Lord, I just thank you for that, um, that testimony we have this morning. Help us to continue to follow you. Help us to praise you in the ways we should. Give us a greater revelation of who you are yes, Lord. to us this morning, Lord. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Now, that last song we sang reminded me of Ephesians chapter 2, the first seven verses. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
So I could preach on this for a while. <laughs> I just wanted to share briefly, though, before the main message. So he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked. So there was a manner of life in which we formerly lived, which was actually death, apart from Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. So there was a way that seemed like life to us, but it was actually death. And the way of life was we lived in the lusts of our flesh. That is whatever felt right to us. We lived, we were indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Okay, I think this is right. This feels right. So whatever I want to do, whatever I think of as life, let's go after it. But that made me, by nature, a child of wrath, under God's wrath. So yes, God is a loving God. But he's a God of wrath too. But he, he says in the next verse, God being rich in mercy, praise God, because of his great love, made us alive together with Christ, even when we were dead. So we did not merit anything God has done for us, okay? All we can deserve, naturally, is God's wrath. But because of Christ's love, now he's made us alive together with him, and he's further, he has set us in heavenly places with him. <laughs> so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us. So there's even there's something even better than this life to come. There is experiencing the presence of God in heaven, seated at the right hand of Christ. So we can thank the Lord when our brothers and sisters in Christ pass, knowing that they're in a better place, and knowing that we have this to look forward to. So this helps us set our hopes on something true, but also challenges us to not put our hope on anything on earth. So let's keep that in mind. So that, that sharing and also the song we just sang reminded me of this. But does anyone have anything else they'd like to share? Anything you've been reading, encouragement, answers to prayer? Uh, me and the kids have been talking about the Ten Commandments. And um, so... We had an interesting situation happen the other day where we were, I think we were discussing the second one, which is you shall not uh, make an image of anything because the Lord is jealous. You shall not make an idol, right? Because the Lord is jealous for you, for your worship. And um, Sarah asked a really good question. She said, uh, Mom, I've never done that. I'm, I've never broken I've never broken that commandment. I've never bowed down to an image. And um, so kind of the flavor of her question was, so what, you know, I, I didn't, I'm not a, I'm not a lawbreaker. And um, it was a really good question. And the way that we illustrated it though, was that was only the second commandment. Um, and then, so, you know, you get to the, the fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh commandment where we're talking about, um, not bearing false witness, and we talked about how that's lying. And even if we do that to our brother or sister, just in our immediate family, if we tell a lie, you know, hey, you know, brother did this to me, and he really didn't, and you got him in trouble just because you wanted to get him in trouble, how that's lying. And um, so that, we've broken that one, you know. So I held up a string. It would be like me holding one end of a string and Tyler's holding the other end. And I said, well, you know, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, well, maybe we haven't done that. Okay, well, maybe we haven't bowed down to an image. You know, maybe we haven't ever physically murdered someone. But now we get to this one where it's saying, don't lie. And I had to cut the string. And what happens then is, see, the string falls. And now my relationship with God is broke. And it didn't matter that I kept all the first three. When you come to the fourth one and you break it, that relationship is broke. And so we've been memorizing um, Galatians 3, 24. It says, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. And then the, the next verse, verse 25 says, so that we would be justified by faith. And I was telling the kids, I said, I want you to understand something. When, I, when me and your dad are teaching you about the Ten Commandments, we're not teaching you the Ten Commandments so that you can go do them and be good people. 
That's not what Galatians 3, 24 says the purpose of the law or the Ten Commandments is. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to be our tutor or our teacher. And it's supposed to lead us to Christ. So we've been talking about two things. The law is a tutor. It's a teacher. It teaches us two things. The first thing it teaches us is that you are a sinner. You've broken your relationship with God. That's the purpose of the law, to bring conviction upon you. You've broken it. You have no relationship with God. It's been severed. You have no goodness of your own. And then the second thing the law is teaching us is you need a savior. You need someone who has always been good, who has never broken that connection with God, who at every point has never failed at that law. And that's Jesus. So the law teaches me that I need goodness. I don't have any of my own. I need Jesus' goodness. He never broke that relationship with his father. He's now saying, you can hide in me. And you can have that relationship with God restored to you. So I told them, I said, if, at, if when you're 18, or whenever the time comes, that you're going to leave our house, I, I said, kids, if you leave here thinking that mom and dad taught you to go and be good people and that you could do it, and that's why we taught you the commandments, you've totally missed the reason we've taught you them. We're teaching you them so that you will run to Christ and hide in Christ. The law is good, but we're not good enough to follow it. That's what it's teaching us. And so it was a good reminder to me that we need a savior. We're the saved in all of this. We're not the good people. We're not the, the you know, these saints. The only reason we can call ourselves saints is because we are putting our faith in the work that Jesus did. He was the only saint. And now we're hiding in him and he's allowing us when God looks at us, he's allowing himself to see Jesus instead of Allison the lawbreaker. So it's just amazing. God is so good, and his law is good, um, but it's teaching us that we don't have goodness and that only Jesus does. So go hide in Jesus. That's good. Thanks for sharing. So I was thinking about Revelation 3. 7 through 13. Been going through the messages to the churches, the seven churches in Revelation. The next one is the message to the church in Philadelphia. So this is Revelation 3, starting in verse 7. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, He who is holy who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God in my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I was making some observations here in these verses. Verse 7. Again, Jesus 
addresses them and tells them about himself. He describes himself like he does for every church in Revelation 2 and 3. He describes himself uniquely, and it's usually in the manner in which they are to overcome. And it's also along the lines of what they are to overcome. So Jesus is holy, true, and he says, quote, has the key of David. So what he means by that, the key of David, Jesus was the messianic or the Davidic Messiah. So God had promised, you can look that up in 2 Samuel 7, 14, the covenant with David, how a descendant of his would sit on the throne forever. So that's what he means. He is has the key of David. But I was also thinking in terms of the, what he says here, that is, it's the key to the city of God and the temple, the dwelling place of God's presence. Okay, keep that in mind. The dwelling place of God's presence. Jesus has the key to that. Jesus is the only one who has made a permanent way into God's presence. The new holy city, Jerusalem, and nobody can take that away from believers. That's what he means when he identifies himself as the one who is holy, true, and has the key of David. Verse 8. This church has kept Christ's word, not denying his name. So they have simply entered the door into God's presence, which Christ has opened. And it says, since they have a little power. So they are recognizing they have little power. They recognize they have little power apart from God's presence. They need to enter God's presence for power. Verse 9. Those who are of the synagogue of Satan are those who follow Satan's teaching. Much like we saw in the church in Smyrna, he also mentions the synagogue of Satan there. If you remember our discussion on that, it is those who are following his teaching, and Satan's teaching is this, that we can have life apart from God. That was the Ephesians 2 that we shared earlier. We were dead in our sins and trespasses in which we formerly walked. So there was this way of life which we thought was life. It was actually death. So, again, the temptation of the serpent in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve was that, well, they surely will not die if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in other words, they can have wisdom and life apart from God without, with not being subject to him. But that was a lie. They experienced spiritual death. They were cast away from the Garden of Eden. There was a curse on them. But there was also a curse on the serpent. If you look at Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.15 says this. Oh, 14 and 15 is the whole thing. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So he put enmity between the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is Christ. He will bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. So Christ will vanquish the enemy, the devil. Christ fulfilled. This is the earliest messianic prophecy. The earliest prophecy that there will be a seed, a descendant of the woman who will do away with evil. Okay? Christ has defeated Satan. Those who follow Satan's teaching, then, will be punished. They're enemies. They're making themselves to be enemies. If we think we can have life apart from Christ, we are his enemy. It's as simple as that. But they will indeed see the glory of Christ through his love for his church. They'll experience Christ's wrath in that, though. So that's what he says in Revelation 3, 9, that I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. So all will see 
Christ's love for his church, some in condemnation and some in eternal glory. <laughs> Those who have received the life of Christ, who have not sought life apart from him, will receive eternal glory and experience Christ's glory in that way. Okay. So then verses 10 and 11 in, in Revelation 3. Since this church has persevered, Jesus will keep them from the hour of testing, which will come upon the whole world. So in this case, to persevere is to continually seek God's presence in daily life as we experience various struggles. So we may not understand exactly what this hour of testing is. We know that Christ is returning, though. That's the big thrust of Revelation, the main theme. Christ is returning, so be ready. So the exact mechanics of how it all works is kind of beside the point. So everything, like from <laughs> Revelation 4 up through Revelation 19, is all these images. It's not for us to figure out. It's to point out, hey, it's going to be an awesome day, and it's one to, God is one to be feared, so get ready. So these the messages to the churches at the beginning and then the message at the end is there's this holy scene of God's kingdom, the new holy city, Jerusalem, which he references here, this message to the church, it comes and he will establish his kingdom. It's a for sure going to happen. So it's not up to us to figure out how and when. We just need to be sure that we'll overcome. So the way to do that is to seek Christ's presence. Continually seek his presence as we experience various struggles. Then verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. But, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my name. In other words, those who overcome will be given a permanent place in God's presence. That's what the temple is, the dwelling place of God's presence. And they'll, they'll be made a pillar, so they'll be given a permanent place in the, the dwelling place of God, God's presence. So what I'm seeing here is the message to this church is to overcome testing by the presence of Christ. It's something we should experience now, and the promise when we overcome is that we will be given a permanent place in his presence. We'll belong to him and experience his glory. So thinking about experiencing the presence of Christ in the, quote, temple of God, and that denotes worship of God. Okay? The earthly temple was a place to worship God. And Paul says in a couple places, you know, 2 Corinthians 6 and also Romans 12, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now we are offering spiritual sacrifices to God in worship. Okay? So to worship God in the words of this letter is to seek God's presence, to keep his word, second, and to three, hold fast to his name. Three things there. In other words, experiencing the presence of Christ should affect every aspect of how I live. If I continually experience his presence. So that first point, seeking God's presence. And I was, as I was reflecting on this, in the everyday routine of things, what is my mind set on? Am I, is my mind set on Christ? We can be thinking on God and always thanking him for all he has done for us. We should be. We can be thinking about God's amazing attributes, okay? Like how he is faithful in keeping every promise. A couple scriptures we read this morning already speak to that, but Colossians 3, one through four came to my mind as I was reflecting on seeking God's presence in worship. Colossians 3, one through four. As this. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, 
Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So we've been raised up with Christ. That's kind of like what Paul said in Ephesians 2 that we read earlier. Our life is with Christ. He is our life. And we don't, we don't fully see our life then. He has not come yet in his glory. So I, I need a deeper revelation of this, guys, because I judge things with my eyes. I think my life is in my possessions or my relationships or my finances or various things, my status, whatever it might be, what people think of me, simple things even. Those things are not my life. My life is Christ. That's what the scripture tells us. Do we believe it? So let's set our mind on the things above. Are the things above our Christ himself, who is our life. And then he says, when he is revealed, we will be revealed with him in glory. So we don't fully understand who we are, guys. We are glorious creatures. We are spiritual creatures made alive together with Christ, seated with him in heavenly places. So understanding that, we can overcome any test here on earth. Okay? Seeking God's presence is how we will overcome any test. Understanding that no matter what happens to me, even if my physical body is killed, that is not my life. My life is Christ. Okay? I'll be raised from the dead. All right? And then thinking about, you know, that's what Christ has done for us. But then we can also, in seeking God's presence, reflect on his character. Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 63, 1 through 4. It says this. O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary, to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. So David is realizing something here. He's seeking God earnestly. And there's, he's recognizing his need. His soul is thirsty. And there's something he's recognizing about the world around him. There's no water here. There's no nourishment for my soul here on earth, is what he's saying. But there is nourishment in God. To seek him, to see his power and his glory, his very essence, his working, his working and his essence, his very being. That's what will nourish our souls. So we need to seek his presence. And David has a realization here that God's loving kindness is better than life. So God's love expressed to experience God's love is better than anything here on earth. Is that what we're seeking? If we're seeking God's love, we have to recognize something. That we are, we're sinners. We cannot enter his sanctuary. We're not worthy. Christ has made a way though. He's offered up himself. We are not, we are not deserving of that. We have this idea that somehow we are deserving. <laughs> We're entitled in some way to Christ's blood. This awesome almighty God. We're somehow entitled to what he's done for us. That is not true. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. But God being rich in mercy made us alive together with him. So then the proper response is verse 4 in Psalm 63. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. So to seek God inherently means we will be praising him. We will be honoring him with our lives. Okay? And then the last, the second two points, 
second points two and three flow along with that, to keep his word and hold fast to his name. So to keep Christ's word. As I was reflecting on this, it's not just knowing the Bible, okay? To keep his word, it's to pay attention to scripture, but there's also the voice of God in that. Are we really seeking to discern God's voice in the scripture? There are many people who read God's word, but they're not keeping it. They might be memorizing it even. They might be even teaching it. But are they themselves allowing themselves to be transformed by the working of Christ through his word? And we read how God created us. How did God create in the beginning? He spoke. Yes. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be light. And in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things came into being through him, it says in John chapter 1, the, the word. We need to keep his word. Allow ourselves to be created, renewed, restored by him. And in thinking about that, it's not just knowing the Bible and seeking to follow it on my own strength, my own wisdom, and my own ideas of spirituality, okay? We should not add anything to God's word. And the question is, is God's word sufficient for us? Is it sufficient for everything in life? Should be, as Christians. The Bible makes exclusive claims on truth. What is true truth? The Bible tells us. We either believe that or we don't. It's as simple as that. Keeping his word, but then holding fast to his name. Am I content in being called a child of God, in other words? Do I actively seek fellowship with his other children? If we are holding fast to his name, then we have to recognize that we are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ, corporately, as the body. That's not just this individual thing. We need to be seeking fellowship. We should not be giving up meeting together, okay? But actively encouraging one another, knowing that God is coming soon. A reference for that is Hebrews 10, verse 25 been studying Hebrews lately. That's our uh, Wednesday night Bible study. And it's, there's a lot here. Like it's really thick book, but the overall message of Hebrews is to endure. Okay. Keep in mind who God is and endure. Hold fast to it. Don't compromise. And that's what he's saying in Hebrews 10. Start in verse 19, 19 through 25. He says this. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, entering God's presence, in other words, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, so to draw near to God, it's to enter his presence, okay? Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's the only way we can enter God's presence. Being sprinkled clean by Christ's once-for-all sacrifice. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the day, he means, is of Christ's return. As we see that drawing near, they saw it drawing near in those times, how much more should we? So we need to then hold fast our confession, understanding that God's nature, God's character, he has promised he is faithful. And then we should stimulate one another 
to love and good deeds. So again, it's not just this individual faith we're to hold on to. It is a meeting together, not giving up meeting, not forsaking our assembling together, as is the habit of some. And it's amazing these days, some states have put restrictions on churches meeting. They've put parameters whether they can even meet at all. That's amazing to me. And there are some churches who are standing up. They are taking a stand for the faith, not allowing the government to tell them how to worship. And there are people who are experiencing <laughs> worldly consequences for that. There's a pastor up in Canada in jail, facing jail time. It's amazing to me. So let's not give up our meeting. Let's encourage one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. So the day drawing near is going to, we're going to experience trials, suffering on earth. And that's what the message to the church in Philadelphia is. They have kept the word of his perseverance. So he will keep them from the hour of testing. It doesn't mean we're not going to experience trials. But the hour of testing is when he comes to establish his kingdom. They will be kept. They will be preserved. Their souls will be preserved. Okay. So as we, as we seek God's presence, keeping in mind his ultimate plan, we need to really hold fast to his name. And it's going to be especially important, important as we will encounter a world that is increasingly secular and anti-Christian as I just mentioned with the church in Canada. There will be pressure to compromise, okay? We can see that very clearly. And it's going to get worse as the years, as the weeks, as the month, and days progress. We don't know how many days we have left on earth. It's just going to get worse, though, in, from this aspect of pressure from the outside. There will be pressure to compromise, but we should not. We will be chided. For various reasons. Well, you guys are intolerant. Or you're closed-minded. Or you're unscientific. There's this perception, just a side note, there's this perception that the Bible is not based on science. Well, actually, science can prove the Bible. There's various things you can look up for that. More on that at a different time. All those things are idols, though. This idea of tolerance, this idea of inclusion, of having these man's ideas of what it means to be open-minded. That's our own thinking. Okay? A couple verses that we've already addressed this morning, thinking about man's thinking. Genesis 3, they thought what was right. That's the thinking of the devil. The synagogue of Satan, as it says in Revelation 3, 7 through 13. The teaching of Satan is that we know what's right. That's an idol. And then the whole idea of being scientific. So kind of along those same lines. We can figure out this world. We can figure out how to preserve our lives, how to even attain eternal life. And maybe it's not here on Earth. Maybe we need to go to another planet outside our solar system, whatever it might be. I mean, God is, through general revelation, allowing us to see him through his creation. But so many people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, like Romans 1 says. We need to understand that everything God is allowing is so that we would turn to him. So those things are idols, man-made ideas of what true life is. But Jesus' words are definite and complete. That's the encouragement to the church in Philadelphia to hold on to those, his words more than anything. And that's the encouragement to us. Let's look at how the Bible ends. Revelation chapter 22. It's consistent with what he's saying in Revelation 3. So Revelation 22, 12 through 19. It says this, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. 
Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come. Let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. That's pretty serious exhortation here. His words are complete. If you add to them, you're going to experience the plagues or the sickness or the curses that are on the people who refuse God's word. If you, if you then take away from the words of this book, God will take away your part from the tree of life and from the holy city. So in other words, if God's word, we don't see it as complete or sufficient or true, we don't have a place in his presence. So we need to experience God's presence. Like we read in Psalm 63, David saw that there's no life here on earth. His soul is thirsting in a dry and weary land. But God promises in Christ that he will give from the water of life without cost, the spring of life, to those who are thirsty. So only he can sustain us, okay? He is the source of true life. What we need to do is overcome, wash our robes, to be pure, to seek God's presence. As we do that, he will purify us, to keep his word. In other words, to listen to his voice and to practice it, being sanctified and persevering as we see the day of his return drawing near. That's holding fast to his name, too. Being called his children, being in fellowship with his body letting him have his way in us. So we can overcome testing by the presence of Christ. Only by the presence of Christ can we overcome every test. His power working in us, guarding us, keeping us. So Psalm 23, right? The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. We have everything we need as we follow our shepherd as we experience his presence, as we allow him to purify us and make us like him. Praise the Lord. So let's spend some time in prayer.